Welcome to chapter 14 of PAX. Peter recognized Vola's footsteps, the hard wooden stamp followed by the softer shoe footfall, and dropped the logs back to the wood bin. He braced himself in the cabin doorway, watching Vola pump water in the kitchen sink. You staying off that foot? Pretty much. Actually, he'd gotten up at least a dozen times to do pull-up on a beam, and he lifted logs for half an hour. His arms were sore and his foot hurt a lot when it wasn't raised. But he hadn't been able to lie around doing nothing, knowing that Pax was still out there. Bola began lathering up her hands without turning around. You write that note? Peter pulled the crutches to his sides. Already he felt more secure when they were tucked under his arms. I did, but... No buts. You write once a week. The bus driver friend I told you about, Robert Johnson, I'll ask him. He'll mail them from different spots along his route. First condition, remember? Peter tried a sharp turn, wobbled, but righted himself. He swung through another turn, smoother. All right? Okay. Good. Vola hung a dish towel on its peg, crossed to the fireplace, and began treading newspaper onto the grate. Let's move to the second condition, then. That charm bracelet you carry. I'm guessing it was your mother's. Why do you carry it with you? Why that particular thing? Peter felt his body go rigid the way it always did whenever anyone asked him about his mother, as if it had to freeze to decide whether it was okay to talk about her or not. Usually with strangers, it wasn't. But it wasn't. So he was surprised when his hands relaxed their grip on the crutches a little and his throat eased open. She always wore it. She'd hold her wrist up so I could play with it when I was a baby. I don't remember that, but I've seen pictures. I do remember her telling me about it, though, about the charm, I mean. It's a phoenix. That's a special bird. It's red and gold and purple and colored like the sunrise, and it it rises from the ashes. I know what a phoenix is. Right, but out of its own ashes. That's the part my mom cared about. Its own ashes? When it gets worn out, it builds itself a nest high in the tree away from everything. Peter stopped. It suddenly occurred to him that Vola's cabin felt like a nest. He circled on the crutches to look around. Yes, a secret protected nest surrounded by trees away from everything. He turned back to Vola, who was cross-stacking kindling. He hoped she hadn't read his mind. So the phoenix fills the nest with its favorite stuff, myrrh and cinnamon... It's what's in the story, I think. Then the nest ignites, burning the bird's old body, and the new bird rises up out of the old bird's ashes. My mother loved that. She said it meant that no matter how bad things got, we could always make ourselves new again. Bola didn't respond. She touched a match to the shredded paper and watched as it caught fire. Her face looked grim in the light of the new flames, and she added two logs, and then a third, and then a third. Go try those crutches outside while there's still some light, she said, without looking up. Peter opened the front door and navigated the step, relieved to get away. He didn't have a clue what he said wrong. Living in the woods all alone probably made a person weird. But she was right and he that he needed to practice outside. He lost a whole day now, a whole day. Maybe he did need some time to train and heal, but he was leaving as soon as he could. He left the cleared yard and headed to where the uneven ground was snarled with roots and brush. It took a torturously long time to circle the cabin. His second turnaround was a little faster, and by the fifth circuit, he felt almost comfortable, but he was bathed in sweat by the time he sunk, swung inside. The cabin was quiet except for the gentle crackling of the fire, and Bola sat in the armchair sewing something yellow. The quiet and the way the sun seemed to wash the cabin in peace, as if everything were right in the world. Suddenly he felt mocking to Peter. Everything was wrong with the world. Another day had passed when Pax had been out there alone. Another night was coming and he would be cold, probably hungry and scared too. What if he hadn't found water? Took a lurching swing across the room. Halfway across, one crutch caught in a rug and he had to stab the other into the wall to keep from crashing into the lantern. Shorter steps. You'll get the hang of them after a while. After a while? My fox will be dead in a while! He dropped the crutches and sank to the chair at the kitchen table. What's the point, anyway? How is this supposed to work out? 
Lola dropped her sewing. What do I look like? A magic eight ball? She went out to the porch and came back with a bag of ice, and she lifted Peter's foot to a chair and arranged the ice over it. I don't have your answers. The sight of his useless foot reminded him of everything he couldn't do now when he looked away. Why not? Aren't you supposed to be wise and all, living out here by yourself with all your... With all these... He threw his thumb toward the jumble of notes tacked on the board behind him. All these philosophy bingo cards? You're supposed to be wise, at least, aren't you? Or witchy or something. Peter almost didn't recognize himself, back-talking the woman like this. He felt as if he were short-circuiting, as if his impulses were leaping directly out of him without passing through his brain. But once again, he wasn't where he should be, and now his foot was too wrecked to get him there, and Pax was still out there alone. Vola picked a bucket from the cardboard and set it in the sink. Philosophy bingo cards. She looked only mildly insulted. I'm trying to figure out my own life. I don't have your answers. So who does? And don't say my father, because he's a little absent these days. And because he caused all this. Peter hardened his jaw against saying the words and forced himself to breathe slowly. He wasn't angry. He was just frustrated. Anyone would be. Sudden tears threatened. What was wrong with him lately? And he knuckled his eyes. Vola started over to him and then seemed to change her mind. She backed away to lean against the kitchen counter. You are angry, she said simply, as if she were noting he had dark hair or the sun was going down. I'm not angry. But he forced his fists open and counted ten slow breaths, fighting it the way he always did. Because what if he was like his father with that threatening kind of anger? The kind that was always simmering. The kind that could boil over at any time and hurt anyone in the way. The apologies afterward never healed the damage. He squeezed his eyes shut against the tears still crowning. I'm not angry. It's just that I didn't choose it. I didn't choose for there to be war. I didn't choose for my father to join up. I didn't choose to leave my home. I didn't choose to go to my grandfather's, and I sure didn't choose to abandon the animal that I took care of for five years. You're a kid. You don't get a lot of choices. I'd be angry, too. Diable man angry. I told you I'm not angry! Peter gulped in a sob that somehow escaped as a twisted laugh. He was short-circuiting again. And you're in love with that word, you know. What word are you talking about, boy? Diable man. What is it? A swear? You're in love with the word diable man. His wiring felt totally fried. If we were in second grade, I would tell you you're so in love with that word that you should marry it. She squawked a low crow's caw. <laughs> but you're right, she said. I should get down on one diable man ruined me and ask that word to marry me. You should, Peter agreed, kind of hysterical now. You should put a diable ring on its di <laughs> sorry, you should put a diable man ring on its diable man finger. He wiped his face off and watched Vola as she came over and took the seat across from him. My grandfather swore in his first language. It drove my grandmother crazy because she didn't speak it. But she sang in Italian when she cooked, so Bio, or Vola lift a finger to stroke the feathers burned at her throat, a bunch at her throat. I carry many traits, she said quietly. And then she went silent for a while, holding his gaze the whole time. In their silence, Peter felt they were saying something important. Something about the long, dark tunnel he felt narrowing around him. I was counting on finding Pax in a week, maybe ten days. He looked at his foot. Now? Pax? That's his name. It means peace, you know. Peter knew that. Lots of people told him. That's not why I named him. First day I brought him home, I left him for a minute. Just a minute so I could get him some food. And when I came back, I couldn't find him. He'd crawled into my backpack and fallen asleep. It had the word Paxton sewn on the label. I was seven then, and I figured Paxton, that's a good name. And it had an X in it like Fox, you know. But now, but now what? Now he's all alone because of the war. I let him go because of the war. War, not peace. What's that called? Irony? Whatever. Now it's a terrible name. He'll probably die because of the war. Maybe yes, maybe no. He could survive. It's 
it's spring. Plenty of food, I'd think. Peter shook his head. Foxes teach their kids to hunt when they're about eight weeks old. I found him way before that. He was maybe two weeks old, the vet figured. He could run across a dozen mice sitting on up on little plates, and he wouldn't be, catch them. All he's ever had is kibble, and the scraps I'd let him swipe. Well, what kind of scraps? Anything he'd find out there? Peter shrugged. Well, he's crazy for peanut butter. He loves hot dogs, loves eggs. No, unless he stumbles into someone's picnic, he's going to starve. Well, he'll find water, I figure, but... He could probably go a week without food, but after that, Peter dropped his head into his hands. I let it happen. I didn't choose any of it, but I didn't fight it either. I don't know why I didn't fight it. Except, of course, he did know. When his father had dropped the order about packs, Peter had steeled himself and said, no, I won't do it. But his father's eyes had flared with that flash fire anger, and his fist had jerked up, stopping only at the last the last split second to knuckle Peter's cheek in a gesture that carried enough threat to set Pax on a growling alert. Peter's own fist had come up, and the rage he'd felt at his father had scared him more than the threat itself. He heard his grandfather's words now, Our apples don't fall far from the tree. And he felt sick and afraid all over again. He stopped his gaze to the worn pine table to hide the shameful headline he felt burning across his face. Bowler reached over and cupped the top of his head with both hands, and Peter froze. Except for the occasional attaboy, shoulder shake from his father, or a casual arm punch from one of his friends, no one had touched him since his mother. Vola paused as though she knew he needed time. Then she pressed down firmly. It was a strange thing to do, but Peter didn't pull away. Didn't move a muscle. Didn't even draw a breath, because at that moment, her strong grip was the only thing keeping him from flying apart. I'm going to stop there and we'll pick up the second half of the chapter in the next video.